We're here on church number four in Revelation of the seven churches, the church at Thyatira. I'm going to be in a moment. You can turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, we'll begin at verse 18 in just a moment. But um, we want to look at this church as we've gone through some of the churches now. We've looked at church at Ephesus and then Smyrna. And then last week we looked at Pergamum. And now we look at the church at Thyatira. Uh, a. Roger Merrill tells of a, a business consultant who, who wanted to landscape his home and garden. He hired a lady with a doctorate in horticulture and how to do this kind of stuff. And, and what he did is he brought her in and he said, I want to I wanna, I wanna have a nice uh, you know, looking landscaping and gardening and those kinds of things, but I want, I want it to be um, hands off. In other words, I, I, want it to, I want it to be able to do well by itself without having constantly to um, tend to it and uh, so he went through all that he said I want I want no maintenance little or no maintenance you know and everything so I want auto sprinklers I want uh, anything that can save me labor and time I want to use that in this in this uh, uh, in my landscaping in my my home garden and so finally uh, she she uh, looked around at everything and as he got, went on and on about this being self sufficient garden and landscaping finally she said to him uh, there's one thing you need to know before we continue this project if there is no gardener there is no garden if there is no gardener there is no garden as our church continues to grow I hope that as individuals that make up the body of Christ uh, that you would also be growing uh, when I say growing I'm uh, as a church I'm not talking only about numerical what's the attendance on Sunday or how much uh, how much is the church got financially and those kinds of things but really we're talking about spiritual growth spiritual things that are happening and taking place uh, as a whole because of individuals who are growing in Jesus Christ um, did you know you can be unhealthy in a healthy church spiritually? It's kind of like going to the gym and being out of shape, but being in the gym with a lot of other people who are exercising and making progress in that way. And, and that's the same thing that you can do spiritually. The spiritual side of it is that you can be in a good church that's got... Uh, that's healthy that's moving in the right direction where God is moving and God is working and you have to own your spiritual growth you have to be intentional about it so let's look at the uh, book of Revelation again with the church at Thyatira chapter 2 beginning at verse 18 would you stand with me as we read God's word today Revelation chapter 2 beginning of verse 18 the Bible says this to the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze I know your works your love and faith and service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first but I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed. And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only Hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. As when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches 
Uh, let's pray together. Father, we invite you into this time, and we ask, God, that your spirit would speak. As you spoke to these seven churches originally, we ask and invite you to speak to us today. We are a part of your church. We are your people called by your name, and we desire to be all that you want us to be. And so, Lord, today we ask that your spirit through the word would shape us today, God, as we seek after you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. This is uh, really, uh, you may have picked up on this already, but this is the longest uh, passage to the seven churches. It's the longest of what uh, he has to say to the seven churches. And, and, um, and this church, though, is, is a, a different. Uh, now, Thyatira was really, in some ways, the least significant of all the seven churches. It, it was not a political or a social or a religious or an economic or cultural hot spot in the Roman Empire or among these other seven churches. It, it's just really uh, uh, insignificant. But God had more to say to the church in Thyatira than he did any other church. Why? Because they were growing. Now you say, well, why? if they're doing things right, if they're growing, if they're moving in the right direction, why would God have anything to say to them? Because there is a danger even in growing. In growing spiritually, in growing numerically, in growing and being more effective. Uh, and as the body of Christ, as more people come to know Christ and are being discipled and are, are participating in the life of the body of Christ and the church, then there's actually some difficulties that accompany that. Some things may be issues like, well, there's not enough space in the sanctuary. There's not enough parking space. Uh, there's a lot of new people. We have to have new teachers to for new classes and, and those kinds of things. But, but really the, the issue is, I think, the one that, we, that, that, that he's dealing with here as he speaks to the church in Thyatira is not about space or those kinds of things, but the issue is that you can grow broad, you can grow wider and still be shallow. You can grow wide and never know the deep things of God. In fact, he rebukes them because there are some who are, who are learning the deep things of Satan. You know, they're, they're going on into some, some false places. And so there's that danger. He says in verse 19, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. In other words, you are growing not only as a church, but you're growing, and this is how a church grows, by the way, you're growing as individuals. You're making progress. There, you, are, you, are, you are moving forward spiritually. And your latter works or your most, most recent works exceed the works that you were doing in the beginning because you're learning about what it means to live in the Spirit. You're learning the, what it means and what it looks like and how to, how to discern what it means to live life and minister and, and in, the, in the Spirit of God and, and allow God's Spirit to work through you. All these things are important. Uh, I was talking one time with a, a previous staff member who had gone out and moved on to another assignment and... Uh, and he was dealing with frustration because uh, the, in, in the church that he was at because they weren't experiencing growth either numerically or, or uh, just a lot of growth that he could, he could measure. And he was frustrated and he, was, and, uh, he had just gotten to the point where he's like, you know, it's just not, it's not gonna, I don't know if it's going to happen here. Out of his frustration he was speaking and I said something that may not, it may sound like it's not really encouraging words. But at the end of the day I said, listen, there's only one of two problems. In, in, in the life of the church. Either the gospel is no longer effective or you're in the way. Now think about that for a moment. Now we want to put that on the preacher and I was talking to a pastor but we want to put that uh, uh, on the pastor only but, but can I just challenge you today that, that uh, uh, the, the life of, of, of the church of Jesus Christ is, is, is full of a vibrancy and an attractiveness in the things of the Spirit. Now there may be a lot of people who will reject the gospel. They'll reject life in the Spirit. They don't want to live that way. They don't want to be that way. But I'm here to tell you today that where there is spiritual life, there will be a drawing that is from the Holy Spirit that is changing people's lives. 
and either the gospel, either we come to the place where we uh, uh, say the gospel is no longer effective, or we come to recognize maybe I'm in the way. Maybe I am uh, a hindrance to what God wants to do in the life of his church. Uh, you ever wonder what God cares most about in the church? Because sometimes I'm, I, I really believe that we get more bent out of shape about things that God doesn't care anything about. And what we need to do, if we're going to claim to be like Christ, if we're going to claim to be Christians, we're going to have to start being, having our affinity, our preferences, our opinions, all those things line up in submission to God. And say, you know what, if I'm concerned about it and God's not concerned about it, then it's probably not that big of a deal. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. If I'm concerned about it and God's not, then what I'm concerned about is irrelevant. I need not be concerned about that. I need to put it on the shelf somewhere. We get our human preferences and we tend to want to spiritualize them about what I want. It must be the most spiritual thing going. And it's more important what anybody else wants, what their opinion is. But that's simply not true. And what is the measure then of a healthy Christian, of a healthy Christian? church what makes a good church i don't think it's about what some some people think about so you got different people it's a lot of churches in fact are stalled out spiritually there's no growth there's no spiritual life in them because everybody's too busy trying to get their way about everything about preferences or whatever it may be uh, but here we have a church that's growing they're saying your latter works are exceeding your first works you're growing you're making progress can i just say that the measure of a healthy christian is growth it's growth so sometimes we need to evaluate ourselves and examine ourselves the bible talks about examine yourself and see if you're in the way uh, look at yourself every once in a while and just like you go annually to the doctor get a checkup it's a, it's a good thing every once in a while um, and maybe frequently to say am i making progress in my relationship with god am i more effective today on behalf of Jesus than I was a year ago is there something taking place in my life that is that is measurable progress measurable growth growth by the way is one of the scientific signs of life if it isn't growing it's either dead or it's at least wounded and sick or in trouble and so he commends them for their growth growth but then he identifies what they're doing wrong he says that they tolerate false teachings and sexual immorality from jezebel that's found in verse 20 on um, verse 20 he says hey this is what i this is what god has against the church of thyatira they're growing they're doing good they're doing more works better works than they did before their their most recent things that they're doing are more effective and they're more significant in the life of the kingdom than when they they first started on the journey but the problem that they have is not that they have totally embraced false teaching but that they tolerate it now that's interesting our culture is rife with this idea of tolerate, tolerating something. Um, do you tolerate something? And here they tolerate this false teaching, the teaching of Jezebel. I cannot emphasize enough. I cannot go over and over and over again enough about how important it is to make sure that what you believe about God is shaped by the Word of God. This Word of God is revelation to us about who God is, about what He expects, about what His character is, or what about uh, all those kinds of things. It tells who God is. We are not expected. In fact, it's a wrong thing to do to try to make a God in our own image. That's idolatry. You don't get to make up what you think about God. This is what divine God defines himself. He says, this is who I am. This is what you need to know about me. This is what I'm telling you about me. And this is the way it is. And so he, he gives us these things. And then he says to the church in Thyatira, this is what I have. You tolerate false beliefs. And the reason it's so important to know who God is and His character and His nature and what He's called us to is because false beliefs always lead to false living or sinful living, I should say. Sinful living. It's, 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 a, it's a pathway. When you believe something incorrectly about God, it will begin to affect how you live your life. 
That's why it's so important for us to be in the Word. So we understand who God is and then what He's calling us to. Almost every single letter of the New Testament, uh, a lot of Paul's letters, and, and, and uh, here in Revelation we have it as well uh, uh, in, this, in this book. But all through the New Testament, over and over again, it's emphasized the problem of false teachers. Why is it such a problem? Because false teachers live, lead people to live, live false lives of holiness in other words it's a counterfeit religion it's a counterfeit righteousness it's a counterfeit holiness it seems spiritual maybe but it's not and this particular issue in this church was about sexual immorality you know um, few subjects are broached uh, more than sexual immorality in scripture I mean all through the scripture in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, to a large degree as well, the issue of sexual immorality is broached over and over and over again. And yet, because uh, of, of some of the cultural influences that some of us have grown up in, especially the older you are, the more influenced you are by these things, we don't like to talk about these things in the life of the church. And yet, Scripture makes it one of the sins that is most repeatedly dealt with over and over again because it is such a driving force in society, in the life of family, and even in the life of the, of the church. Um, uh, so he's saying, hey, look, you've ignored right teaching. That means you're going to tolerate wrong teaching. And we wonder why uh, uh, so much is going wrong in terms of sexual immorality in the life even of some that claim to be a part of the church. It's a sin outside uh, of the church, but it's a sin that's infiltrated in, in the life of the church. And so many look the other way, and it's the same problem of the church in Thyatira. In fact, he's rebuking them for tolerating the sexual immorality that's going on. Nobody's speaking up about it. Nobody's dealing with it. Nobody's doing it. And it's not that we go around as, as some kind of detectives and police force and SWAT team, and we're grabbing people and, and attacking them, and, and we're going to straighten everybody out. But it's not even being tell, told what is right, how is the right way to live and we're allowing false messages to get in in this case someone named Jezebel but in our culture today even in the church it comes oftentimes through things like the television Hollywood is telling our children what is appropriate and inappropriate when it comes to sexuality and I'll tell you right now it's anything but what the Bible says it's so far from biblical truth and if we tolerate it if we allow it to nurture within, our, within the body of Christ, it is always cancerous. It is always like gangrene, and the only way to deal with it is to cut it out. In fact, over and over, um, it talks about uh, sexual uh, sex, by the way, is not always paired with immorality because sex is something God created. It's a beautiful thing in the context that God created it to be in. And it's much like the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River is a powerful thing. It's a good thing. But it, it, everything is in disarray when the Mississippi River gets out of its banks. Right? Cause it wreaks havoc everywhere it goes because it's not what it's supposed to be doing. And same is true of sex. Now listen, our culture wants to tell you that sex is just a physical act. But it's way more than that. It's way more than just a physical act. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 says, Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. In, in many cultures, uh, the marriage, in fact, this is, there's residue of this in our culture, that uh, the marriage ceremony or a, a, a wedding uh, celebration that brought two people together to be a married couple is consummated through that sexual relationship. And there's legal, even legal stuff in our, uh, uh, in our laws today that allow for that. And so what he's saying is, we're doing the consummation outside of the covenant commitment. And that's a problem. And if you've given yourself to that, it's not just a problem that you've, like, oh, you've taken advantage of somebody else, but you've sinned against yourself. You've given something away to someone who has not given you the kind of level of commitment that God says this is what's expected in the marriage covenant. You make a covenant not with only with the other person, but in the context of your relationship with God. This is a significant thing. And so the act of sex is more than a physical thing. If you've had sex outside of, of uh, you'll remember 
who you first had sex with. It will impact your life. You can't just forget about that because it's so significant. He goes on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is what he says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Here he ties holiness. We're a holiness people. He ties it to your sexual ethic. He says, you know, uh, uh, this is the will of God, your sanctification. What does that mean, sanctification? How's that played out? That you abstain from sexual immorality. And so he connects those two things. In fact, you can go in, back in 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to Church of Corinth, in chapters 5, 6, 7, he's talking about marriage, he's talking about sexual ethics, he's talking about all those things. He takes three chapters to talk about those things specifically in marriage, sexual, uh, our sexual relationship, all those kinds of things. It, that's how important this is. Now, can I just say quickly that, that uh, uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings about this. Uh, for example, just because you are tempted sexually does not mean that, that, that you have sinned. All right? And so a lot today, for example, there's a lot going on about homosexuality and people who identify as homosexuals. And so I want to ask them, have you, have you had sex with someone that, of the same gender? Well, no. Then do not allow the temptation to define your life. Uh, the, the, in Scripture, the, the words for uh, homosexuality are not something to define your sexuality. Uh, sexuality, sexuality wasn't defined that way. They were to define the acts. And so actually it doesn't say uh, men who are homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. What it says is those men who practice homosexuality will inherit the, the kingdom of God. And it's an important thing to distinguish, all right? But it's also important that we do not identify. Like most people don't go around saying, well, I identify as a heterosexual. I'm heterosexual. We don't have heterosexual pride day and all those kinds of things. And because there is sexuality that is right and true in the way God intends for it to be, and there is a perversion of that. There is a rejection of the lordship of Jesus Christ by going about sexuality in a way that is different. But do not allow temptation to define you. All right? So uh, there are lots of people who deal with um, homosexuality in terms of that being a temptation in their life, and they begin to take on that identity. I, well, I'm gay. I'm gay. I must be gay. And let me tell you something. Just because you're tempted to steal something doesn't make you a thief. You don't go around saying you're a thief. Just because you may be tempted to lie doesn't mean you're, you're a liar. Uh, you are those things when you act on those things. All right, this has to do with action. And as long as you reject these, these uh, attitudes and these ways of life uh, that are temptations for you, uh, they remain temptation and you remain someone who's living and walking in victory. Now, we live in a sexualized culture. Uh, in fact, every year, one of the things that surrounds uh, major sporting events, especially ones like the Super Bowl, for example, uh, you know what surrounds that? The issue of human trafficking. They talk about that. There's more prostitution goes on and, and all that kind of thing, and human trafficking is a big problem. You want to sol help solve human trafficking? If you're looking at pornography, quit looking at pornography. Say, so, well, I don't pay for it. I'm not contributing to it. Oh, you're paying for it. It's through your advertisement. It's every click that you make is advertising advertisement money that goes right back to that porn, porn industry. And it's a multi-billion dollar and it's enslaving a lot of women and it's objectifying women and children and men for that matter and it's doing all these things. And so all the kinds of, you look at, you look at some of the commercials on television, we have sexualized all kinds of things. In fact, um, a big one that, that's kind of led the way for years and years is alcohol. Uh, and beer commercials have all often objectified women over and over and over and over again. Nobody calls them out for it. The feminists ought to be speaking out. And by the way, they did. That's what led to prohibition. But uh, uh, they ought to be speaking out against some of those kinds of things. Uh, uh, and, and here it is. It, it all plays into this level of brokenness. There is brokenness. And because that brokenness becomes so prevalent in our society, we have come to tolerate it. 
It's just not that big of a deal. And now we have first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation people who have grown up and this has become the norm whether it is broken families and issues where they broken uh, raised in homes where the parents were divorced or uh, raised in homes where the parents weren't married down the line and on and on it goes and what happens is these kinds of things become normalized it's not that big of a deal anymore uh, all across the board and it's a problem it's a, it's a real issue Say, so, well, what if I'm guilty? What if I've done something? What do I do? This is the bad news. He's rebuking them. But here's the good news. The good news is, he says, I'm giving, I've given even Jezebel, verse 21, I've given her time to repent. The problem is she wouldn't repent. She wouldn't turn from what she was doing. She was set in her way. I'm going to live this way. I'm going to do this thing. This is what he says. I gave her time to repent in verse 21, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. They were growing, but they still had room for more. There was more progress that needed to be made. And there's a problem with a lot of people in growth is one of the problems is they just don't want to grow. Like Jezebel, I don't want to move beyond this. I'm not, maybe she came in with that lifestyle and that way of living and that way of being. And, uh, and so she began to promote it in the life of the church. But whatever the case, whether it started somewhere along the way or she brought it in as a, as a new Christian and didn't, never kind of rejected that, was never taught, was never given direction herself, was uh, at this point, the problem is God's dealt with her. He's given her time and he's saying she won't repent. Have you ever thought about what kind of things I look back in my life and I, fit, and I look at how far I've come and the things that God's changed in my life and I think, praise the Lord, He's changed my life. But there are some things that God's changed even in recent years that way back in the beginning I couldn't even begin to fathom. I would have never even thought of that God would want to change those kinds of things in my life. But He did. And He wants to change things today, praise the Lord. And He calls people that. But some people refuse to grow. They refuse to repent. They refuse to humble themselves before God and say, Lord, your way is the right way. And so if I ever find out that your way is different than my way, then I'm going to change my ways. Amen? I'm going to change my ways. And, and they get to the place where they think, well, I got saved, so I'm okay. I got a certificate. I got baptized. I had a religious experience. I, I'm now a member of the church, whatever it might be. But they're not growing today. So there's no forward movement. They've, all, they've become consumers. They're just waiting for somebody to bless them. They're waiting for somebody to serve them. They're waiting for somebody else to do the work of the church. And their, their latter works certainly don't exceed their first works. They panned out somewhere because they tolerated things in their life that were not pleasing to God. Whether it be uh, ideas and thoughts or theology, but ultimately it's about lifestyle and action and what they're going to do. And they get to the place where they believe the church exists to meet their needs. I'll tell you, refusing to grow is a very self-centered place to be. And that's where Jezebel was. She refused to repent. Sometimes I think we just need to get real with Jesus and say, Lord, I forgive me for not growing. You ever thought about that? So, well, I'm not doing any bad things anymore. I'm not doing sexual morality like her. I'm just, but you haven't made any progress. And for years and years and years and years, you've been on a spiritual bottle. And it's time that you are feeding someone else. You are help nurturing the next generation. You are help nurturing the new Christian. You are help reaching out to, to introduce somebody else to Jesus. But you're still requiring all the attention. You're still someone who is being nurtured and must be nurtured and taken care of rather than providing that care. And that's a really self-centered place to be. Some people believe they've grown enough. Well, I've come a long way. There's a lot of people not far enough along, and they're not where I am, and those kinds of things. And Lord, help us with the spiritual pride of believing that we've come far enough. They've grown some, maybe, and they're a little more mature in the Lord than some others, but they think they've arrived, and, uh, and so they've stalled out. With their spiritual growth, they've stalled out somewhere along the way. And then there's those that don't grow because um, they're focused on what they can't do, what they cannot do. You know, 
They, I, I could never be that. I could never live that way. I could never be in that place spiritually. And that's where they feel like that they are. And so they're just like, well, you know, if that's where I, it's at, then that's where it's at. I'm limited. I'm, and they limit themselves. Really, they're not limiting themselves. They're limiting God's ability to do something in their life. But that's what they're saying. I can't do it. I can never be that. I couldn't live that way. I can't live the holy life. I can't be righteous. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And if somewhere along the way, they've got to remember that God is the one that redeemed them to begin with. God's the one that is the saving God. He is the sanctifying God. And as I read the Word of God, it quickens my heart of what the New Testament church was doing and what the New Testament church was attempting for the Lord. And I've committed myself that part of what growth looks like in my life and in the life of the church and probably in your life too is it looks like I'm going to attempt something for God. And if it doesn't work out, if I fail, in it, at least I will attempt something for the kingdom of God. At least I will attempt something. And I'll learn through trial and error if no other way. Because there's a lot of people who say, yeah, I just can't do it. I can't, I'm, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't. That's what they're focused on. Verse 23, the last part, he says, All the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. You know, there are physical indicators that growth is occurring. Uh, when you have a, a baby, you'll find that over time you'll need to get a new size of diaper, a new size of clothing. Um, they'll, their needs are become different. Uh, what entertains them or what they, what they are engaged in is, is different over time they, the, as they grow. Uh, they start to say words, and then they put words together in a sentence, and all those kinds of things happen. And Did you know the same is true spiritually? And he says of the church at Thyatira, your latter works exceed the first. Let me ask some of you who have been in church for years and years and years. And let me ask, this is a, you don't, I don't want you to say anything out loud, but this is a question for you to think about. Have you ever led anyone to Jesus? Have you ever led anybody to Jesus? Do your latter works exceed the first? Some, some people, look, I want to speak to you as your pastor. Some people that are, that are listening to me right now, some of you should be leaders in the church. You should be driving force for the kingdom. And you're still lagging behind. You're still having to be coerced and, and, and talked into things and, and, uh, and patted on the back and all those kinds of things. And you've got to ask yourself, am I growing in the Lord? Are you strong? Are you mature in your faith? Are you growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ. There were some hikers that were looking at mountains and they, they climbed a little hill for a better view and they, they passed some uh, the, the, the mountains that were supposed to be out there and, the, and as they did that, they passed some hikers that were coming down and they asked them, they said, is it worthwhile? And one of the hikers that was coming back down responded with this. He said, anything above the ordinary is always worthwhile. Anything above the ordinary is always worthwhile worthwhile can I tell you the same thing's true spiritually it might be true of a good scenic mountain view but it certainly is true spiritually as well verse 19 he said I know your works your love your faith your service your patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first may that be said of us as well are you growing are you growing today would you stand with me